7 o'clock, I will call our Monday, February 19th meeting to order. Roll call. Joel? Here. Leah? Here. Jim? Here. Andy? Here. Adam? Here. I am here. Dr. Oh. Has our meeting been properly noticed? It sure has. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to read the mission. The Mount Area School District, in partnership with the community, is dedicated to nurturing, educating, and challenging all students, preparing and empowering them to be productive, responsible, and self fulfilled members of society. Thank you, Joe. Uh, 2A, approval of the agenda. So moved. Motion by Jim, second by Carly to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 2B, approval of our February 5th board regular meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Motion by Carly, seconded by Joel. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 3A, school news. We don't have any news. Well, I imagine that Ethan's probably busy uh, preparing for this weekend's solo ensemble. Boy, this is uh, going to be a really neat, neat weekend filled with lots of students from all over the Dane County region. Uh, and a tip of the hat to all of our music staff for just doing a fantastic job. A lot of upfront work, and uh, I know how hard they, they, they uh, kids are just practicing and preparing for what promises to be a very special weekend. Um, I also want to take a moment to congratulate our swim team. Uh, boys swim team had a really fantastic season. It culminated in uh, two of our students heading up to state uh, here this weekend and continuing to make us proud as you can only imagine. Um, I also want to uh, give a tip of the hat to a number of students who are part of our Skills USA program uh, as we prepare. Uh, this is part of CTE month. Uh, our, have several students are traveling up to um, that's right. That's UW stuff. Thank you for the assist. <laughs> uh, Thanks, dribble over to me. Uh, yeah, UW stop this weekend, uh, and we want to thank Sam Schultz as well as Tim Killinger, uh, both of our, our uh, sponsors for that program. And board members, I thought you'd be interested in knowing we continue to work towards a very special evening. Uh, we're calling it ten tentatively the Skull Awards. Um, these are a new annual event that I know that you all have been really uh, wanting us to pursue in our efforts to recognize and reward not only our, our young people, but the people who've left a positive imprint on our young people. And in fact, next Wednesday morning, our administrative council will be inviting a slate of 13 students uh, to come in and visit and celebrate with the admin council. And we're going to notify them that they have been selected for this what will inevitably be a very prestigious award. Um, that event is going to happen on May 22nd. Uh, it's a Wednesday evening. It'll happen right before our scholarships um, uh, program. Uh, we're thinking um, about 5.15-ish. I'll get you more details as the time draws closer. Uh, we're, we were thinking about a venue outside of the high school, but then um, we recognize that maybe we can celebrate more people, our staff included, um, by doing that in our high school. So I'm very excited uh, and thank you board members for the suggestion uh, and uh, the idea uh, that it's going to be a very special night. And lastly, I wanted you to know that uh, we're going to be having an all staff um, volunteer meeting tomorrow. We want to unpack uh, some of the staff wellness survey results. Um, we're going to do that virtually for staff about 3.45 tomorrow afternoon. I want to give a tip of the hat to Erin Esslinger, our Director of Human Resources, for organizing what promises to be a great opportunity for people to ask questions uh, and to also share out some data. Uh, so, busy, busy time here at the home of the Vikings. Thank you, Steve. Does anybody else have any school news? I've got a few things. Um, the well, reminder that Wednesday, this Wednesday the 21st, is the community engagement night at the ELC. Um, so, come on out and, and hear what those plans are um, for that building. I also, on the middle school, I had a chance to visit last week briefly um, on the half day, and they use that half day to 
to do grade awards. So they have the sixth grade, the seventh grade, eighth grade come in uh, to the comments, and it was really neat opportunity to just recognize the students for what they're doing. Um, there were awards for those who improved their grades, those who are on honor roll at the different levels. They recognized the activities they were participating in. So just a I saw Aubrey there with some pictures. So good up. It was it was neat to see um, all the sixth graders together and and get a chance to recognize the work that they and their teachers are doing. And the middle school is also having an applied arts night tomorrow night. Um, so and I think that's it. Oh no, the Dane County Arts Anthology. So Sita Powell was here a few weeks ago talking about the. Um, the students who submitted pieces to the Dane County Arts Anthology, and we had four artists selected, including the the cover art by the eighth grader Nesta Benzing that she was describing to us was selected for the cover of that anthology. So, super exciting and great work from all those teachers. Uh, the uh, PTO is hosting tubing at Tyrol on Friday. So it's $22 for a ticket, and you can go um, register to get the discounted ticket on our Facebook page. We have like almost 60 people oh, right good. now. Yes. Does it come with a free mouth guard? Uh, <laughs> no, spectating is free though, so I uh, think it could be fun to spectate. I've got to protect these pearly lights. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, thank our administration staff for a wonderful breakfast at the uh, transportation garage last week for bus driver appreciation. Um, although as last week, those individuals do a tremendous job getting our students safely to school 180 days a week. So thank them at any time, not just during bus driver appreciation week. So great breakfast. And then secondly, uh, last week I had an opportunity to join Ms. Siebold and our third grade friends. and. Uh, Sarah Straka reminds us how well the math curriculum is doing at the younger grades, and coincidentally, they were doing math, so I got to see that with our energetic and, and ready to learn third graders, so it was a lot of fun. Anyone else? The only other thing that I would add is Aubrey has already done a good job posting that this week is Crossing the Appreciation Week. So wave and honk and <laughs> smile at your friendly crossing guard when you're driving around town. Oh, I have one more. Okay. Uh, Dr. Luna, you took a bunch of kids to the Rotary Symposium. Yes. And uh, I have been quizzed on all of the ethics questions that you guys went through to see what my answers would be. And uh, every family member that has come to our house since then has been quizzed <laughs> on their answers. So thank you for taking them. That was fantastic. Thank you. It was really an honor to be with them. Absolutely. You took a lot of kids. We did. We uh, I think we were the second highest high school in all of the... Dane County region, that's because all of our students were interested in going, so I'm glad we could secure more spots. Awesome. Yeah. Alrighty, 3B, citizens' comments. I didn't see any of that registered. Alright, moving on then to number four, personnel transaction. Anything that we should know? Not tonight. Motion to approve with the addendum. I will second. Motion by Leah, second by Jim to approve our personnel transactions. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Consent agenda. Is there anything anyone would like to pull out to discuss? Did have one small change in the meeting minutes for the education committee, just location. I'm sorry, the, uh, the high mm -hmm. school family consumer science room. Thank you. Jonathan Humphreys, the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Association of Equity and Funding. 
he's done, he and his group have done a lot of work over the last budget cycle and in any years leading up to that as well to advocate on behalf of fair funding for education specifically and closing the gap between low revenue districts and high revenue districts to get some more equity and parity between those districts. And with the, the work that that group has done and the budget that was passed, that they've, he described that they've really made tremendous progress in that, in that equity with the um, low revenue ceiling being raised, bringing all districts in Wisconsin much closer. There's still a lot of work to be done and he's still gonna continue to focus on that. We're not all even and equal. Um, but it was, it was a good, good to hear his update. We asked, we talked a little bit about what, what his, learnings were, what his tips were for advocacy, how he thought it was successful. I and mean, he talked about how, um, you know, he ran key, the, he ran ads in key districts for specific legislators, thanking them for their prior work, finding common ground with them. Um, he mentioned that the legislators like, they appreciate being thanked for progress that has been made. Um, I think things that are intuitive, things that we've known, he's talked about finding common ground between different school districts to kind of broaden that coalition of, of groups advocating for the same thing. And he said what was also very powerful was being able to show certain legislators who had more influence than others to like, look, this is impacting your district um, to really make it more personal for them. And the other thing he said is that going forward he also would like to see better advocacy for the DPI to come up with better proposals to begin with and um, so not just not just advocacy to the legislature but also to, to the DPI to make sure that they're producing um, proposals that have a better chance of getting to the legislature so um, so it was good uh, we also talked about we had an update from Aubrey on the Aubrey and Joel and Leah on the um, Stock the Break Room program. Um, and we reviewed, we spent the rest of the time reviewing some of the policies that one has already come before the board, I think, the, on, um, and one's on the agenda for night tonight for public solicitations, uh, sponsorship and advertising. And so our next meeting is, the, is on Monday. We're gonna get a preview of the sponsorship guide that Aubrey's been working on. Um, that's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, other than inertia, what is the kind of the main forces that are driving still that discrepancy with the high and low um, districts? It's, I think it's structural because the, when the revenue, when the concept of the revenue limit was introduced, it kind of locked into place where districts already were yeah. without a real mechanism to even that yeah. out. And so it really was just that, that structural. Okay. lock and so by by changing the low revenue ceiling that's that's helped but not gotten all the way there he also reiterated advocacy on some other topical areas special education funding that we talked about and things like that to help you know, pressure do you also have any questions for that? Adam, you want to talk about Education Committee? Yeah. Yeah, we had a uh, great meeting over in the Family Consumer Science Room, hosted by Stephanie Schultz, and we had several teachers there, which was awesome, too. Uh, Becky Kudenstein, who's our teacher rep, Katie Hardiman, Tim Killinger, and Barb Rose, but all came. Um, and we had a, um, a few topics that we covered, but I'll start with the, the big one, which was the point of being there, which was the presentation and tour of the facilities over there. Um, Stephanie gave a great, uh, uh, what call it, a presentation. Samantha, I'm so sorry. You know what? I work with the Stephanie Schultz. You know, <laughs> that, like, that does not sound right. Oh, Sam yeah. Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Schultz was there, um, and and we really uh, uh, appreciated getting to see um, her talk through the high demand for these classes. Uh, we have we do an amazing job getting the hundreds of kids in, but there are hundreds more that are waiting to take these, and that's a little bit, speaks to a little bit to the work that they're doing in that area to um, drive demand. Um, Sam's speaking about the support of the community uh, for, for everything that they've done. They have people willing to step up, and this kind of goes for a lot of the courses in that area. 
um, people willing to step up and help out and sort of asking how they can help constantly. So we did talk a little bit about um, forging some more of those connections and then uh, bringing Aubrey into the mix from the grant writing perspective to help provide some resources to put those to use as well. Um, the, uh, there were some cool things that uh, Sam's relying on too there with her connections with her past employer which helped get her kids into her Camp Randall for food prep and concession facilities and showing them what a, a pro environment looks like. And uh, we did talk, you know, just you always want to ask, like, what more could we do um, if you had an unlimited budget? But it was uh, just about offering the number of, like, active labs because those are the, the things that take the money that you're blowing through money on. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. And also just the, that it's five years now in that facility and that you're starting to see some of the either wear and tear or newer level equipment that could be purchased at some point to, to get kids a great experience in there. Um, we also covered a few other issues, just the testing season's underway, um, and talked a little bit about the online test prep for juniors uh, heading into ACT. Hopefully that's going to help out some of their performance. Um, Evidence-based grading, uh, work continues on that. We had a meeting with staff members participating in the first round of adoption. Um, and we're going to get a uh, update at, a mar at the March meeting from the assessment and grading task force on that. And last thing was the pupil non-discrimination review process. We only had seven survey respondents provide feedback, but Sarah Straka says that's semi-consistent with past results and she got good high quality feedback out of that. So that would be one of the factors that goes into the report. Um, we as a board will receive that final report uh, April 1st. That's what I have written down there. Awesome, thank you. Good. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the job that they've done in attracting students to that. Are they taking any kind of different marketing approach on that or is it a function of the types of classes or did they address that specifically? I mean, is there, a, is there some best practice in there that we should be looking at? It's a good question. I didn't remember anything specifically that jumped out about that. I feel like it's based on reputation. Yeah, I think so it's just desire to be. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Which is interesting because I've heard, uh, in fact, I think I just saw at some other school, they, had, they call it like a culinary science degree or certificate sure. or something like that that they were marketing as. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, they seem to be doing pretty well just on the reputation of the classes. <coughs> Kids love her and love her yeah. class. Like, that sure helps. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. okay. Well, there's our best practice. Yeah. Okay, so many more Sams. Okay. Yeah. yeah. She she shared about how students came in there before school during their lunch break to hang out to cook food, and she lets them like they bring in their yeah. lunch and they want to cook it as long as they clean up. Like it just sounds like kids really enjoy being in that space and with her. Alrighty, I have the Community Coalition. Um, we met on January 23rd, and I think most of what I have to share you heard at our joint meeting at the Village and uh, Chamber. We had an update on the Mount Hora Child Care Initiative, uh, where they're working to get some in-home providers up and running, providing funding, trying to develop some partnerships and learning opportunities. Uh, we also talked about housing needs in the village and the housing report. Uh, they're continuing to pursue buying land and connecting with developers who are interested uh, in building a Mount Hora and also beginning to rewrite some of the zoning codes uh, to provide more flexibility for uh, building uh, greater density and different kinds of developments to offer different kinds of housing. One of the other areas of uh, focus for the Community Coalition is business recruitment. Uh, the Village and the Chamber are going to co-host a downtown summit in April to better understand some of the fears and dreams uh, for downtown growth from the business owners in town uh, and then use that feedback to help uh, update the downtown development plan. And then the workforce development component, which is related to the school district, uh, we talked about the job fair in March. A workforce needs survey that they have talked about implementing with the business owners, Fall Career Day, helping to uh, place our growing demand of apprenticeship, youth apprenticeship.
internship students and uh, and then also just exploring ways you know Dr. Salerno and I experienced this when we were able to speak at Good Morning Mount Corp last summer some of the questions and comments that came from the business owners were the district is already doing those things offering classes our students have those skills so trying to figure out better ways to make sure that our business community knows how well prepared our students are um, and then the last thing was the chambers trying to think about different ways to connect with students whether having student memberships um, a young professionals network trying to just kind of get some student networking going um, there and our next meeting is April 23rd and then Joel do you have a village report I think you just made it oh, oh, I was gonna say I think yeah. they're all the same yeah pretty much the same. <laughs> a couple that I would just add the the zoning piece sounds like it's they're they're commissioning they've awarded the contract now and it looks like it's a pretty deep dive they're gonna rewrite I don't know what they're exactly going to do but it looks like it allows them to possibly rewrite the entire zoning sure. ordinance which I think would be um, something to be considered the only other thing on the agenda that popped up was they have proceeded now with the and I think you saw in the paper the care call in with kind of moving the owners along in terms of what needs to be done with that property so they've uh, push the gas on that, which I think potentially has an impact in terms of what we do here. So. Thank you. That's it. Oh, we meet again the first Wednesday, 5th of March, 6th of March, something like that. So anyway. they meet again. I showed up. Sorry. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Joe? All right. Moving on to our action items. 7A, <coughs> second reading. Consider revisions to board policy 850 public solicitation promotions of school. Right. It's been a couple of weeks, so I'll just give you a recap. Um, so, as part of one of your focuses, I've been tasked with setting up uh, the process for enabling businesses to advertise at our events and partake in sponsorships. And then alongside of staff and other school districts, I worked hard to create a guide that breaks down said opportunities and relevant policies, as well as agreements and forms. Uh, but we'll get into the nitty gritty of that guide in a future meeting. Uh, first, we need to adapt policies, including this one, which is 850, public solicitations and promotions on school premises just to allow the district to offer these opportunities and efficiencies. So I've made Joel's quick update to the bottom of this one. So I removed um, basically when students are involved just to make sure that the method of distribution uh, shall cause the least, will be the least intrusive possible. Thank you. communication, um, a return to work form also included with this for any kind of leave of absence due to an illness or medical um, condition. Um, we didn't have any suggestions last time when we looked at the first reading. So. Employee personnel record. Yes, um, 
we did talk about making a small revision to the fourth paragraph about the separate files, maintaining separate files for medical and disability records, and the, the line that said such files will be treated confidential made it seem as though the files themselves may not be confidential. So just a removal of that. Um, other than that, there was no changes from first reading. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second that. Motion by Leah, seconded by Adam to approve revisions to board policy. I almost jumped ahead. 526 employee personnel records. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, Aaron. All righty, Brian. Consider revisions to board policy 447.3, suspensions and expulsions. Yeah, this is kind of a meaty policy. Um, it looks like there's a lot of red lines, but a lot of it was moving around too to provide clarification. Um, it kind of starts out with um, just generalizing some of the components. And so we don't need to say idea 2004, just idea in general. Um, we also put in the sub, like we subcategorized all of the data so that it was easier to read because it goes into suspensions and then the different portions of expulsions. So um, here it starts with just general expulsions. Um, what kind of is required through there? Um, I think that there, we moved the criteria for early reinstatement. We deleted it there because it makes sense to talk about the expulsion process before early admittance already. So it's just, you'll see the same stuff down below. The one addition to the expulsion process um, was something that we do as a district, but our attorney wanted us to specifically write it, that if we would give the implication or have the um, expulsion hearing in open session, that the parent could um, basically force the district to make sure that it's in closed session. So that was that's the, um, the wordage that our attorney had asked us to include. Um, in our expulsion process and specifically special education services, um, really directly writing that when students have been removed for, for 10 days, we need to have a meeting to determine if it's a pattern of removals, constitute a change of placement, um, and then we need to conduct a manifest determination. So that's all specific law um, that we would have to do in those circumstances. Would you be so kind as to explain what manifestation determination hearings are about? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's a part of the IEP process, and so if a student has a disability, um, we, what we would end up looking at is the alleged behavior. Is it a direct cause manifest of the student's disabilities? Um, and if we can make a direct substantial relationship that they did this because of that, uh, then they actually, we can't move forward with the punishment or the suspension expulsion agreement. Um, but if it isn't, um, then we can still move forward with it. Um, and if it is, then we've got to, you know, redo the IP and figure out what other steps need to go in place. Have we done a positive behavior intervention plan? Do we have a behavior plan in place? All of these questions that come out once we get to a manifest determination point. So that's probably like the quick reader's digest, but is there questions on that or is that? It's really nicely done, thank you. Okay. Um, here's just the previous um, part, and I, I did notice the first sentence, so if you do catch that, I'll, I'll remove where it says there slash is her. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then for pre-expulsion, um, it's just again clarification that an advance agreement can't be used um, to encourage or require a student's withdrawal from the district. So we can't say, we won't expel you if you open enroll into a virtual school, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can't make that a cause of it. It's the advance agreement is to encourage positive behavior to keep them within our school setting and that's stating that within our district policy. Um, and then the admittance of expelled students is removed. Um, I'll be redoing policy 420 next week, uh, or next month at SAW. Um, so that should go into our admittance of students policy, um, not as part of the expel expulsion process. That's that policy. Anyone have any? So 
so I, 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 this might be different from some of our other policies, but it seems like there's a lot of procedure built into this policy that by design. Is that something required for this policy as opposed to breaking that up? a really great observation. Yes, um, it is because by statute there are some procedures and routines that must be honored, yeah. and therefore uh, we asked the board if they could please include that in their policy. Great. We can't vote on this tonight, but does anyone have any other questions or questions? All right, Brian, you want to move on to yeah. 447.33? The, the real purpose of this policy, this policy change um, that you'll see is kind of the last portion of it, and I'll, I'll go through each part, but um, the, the last sentence is where it becomes critical, which is that um, previously, we have not allowed, if a student was up for expulsion, it had specifically written that we will not pay for them to go to an alternative program. Um, so that would look like um, if we want them to go to Operation Fresh Start so they can get kind of hands-on experience, right? We want our kids to be successful um, and no matter what that looks like. And so if what we wanted to change it to is that it has to have prior approval of the program or the policy from the superintendent or designee before we would pay for it. So it gives us the option to do it, but doesn't require us to do it, but it also doesn't allow us not to do it. Um, so that's kind of the, the philosophical change of this. We did add virtual classes, because we do have virtual programs if kids have gone through the expulsion process. Um, we do allow that, so we just want it to be really overt. And it, it for our, our matter, it doesn't matter if it's Madison College or if it's Southwest Tech, it doesn't matter. Um, and so we just want it to be more general in that option as well. Um, and then up in the front, <coughs> part, um, you know, uh, it just is any other options are um, denied to the student as part of the expulsion order. So um, we want the student to, like, they need to make contact with the teachers, kind of get, sign, kind of, you know, kind of continue to make that effort and that work. Um, but there might be some circumstances where maybe that teacher was directly involved with the expulsion, and so we would uh, not allow that to happen. So we would make other arrangements, but it just kind of clarified that as well. To those who might be listening into the meeting, uh, it may be helpful to put this all in a perspective because we're talking a lot about expulsion tonight. Um, we're fortunate to be in a district that the board has allowed uh, staff to engage and help support students before ever having to get to expulsion. Um, and there are lots of tools at our disposal as a district, as staff, teachers, and all. Uh, and, I, and I think the proof is in the pudding. Um, one expulsion uh, recommendation in at least the last eight years that I, I've been here, um, and uh, that's really a testament to uh, you um, being supportive of families. It's a testament to the staff providing wraparound care, not only to the student, but also to the family, and holding high expectations for our young people. But so it's important that we kind of put this in perspective. I don't want people to think, oh my word, uh, we're expelling students left and right now. That's just not the case. We're not doing this a lot, but it does, it really matters to, uh, to the students that are in a situation, and, and we want them to be successful and still get an education and, and be successful, so. Small number, but important. With that change to the end, um, where we talk about that we may choose to fund some of those alternatives, does that change or is that something that we need to deal with on the process side of this in terms of notification to a family? Because without it, we would never have to make any kind of notification, but the minute we put that in there, I think we probably put ourselves legally responsible to notify the family of the expelled student that this is an option. Yeah, so usually what, ha what, what happens in my experience is once a, a student goes through an expulsion process to the board, the board recommends the expulsion. And then depending on if the student has an IP or not, um, sometimes it's a collaborative effort with Sarah and I um, to determine how we're gonna continue to get their credits to finish their graduation um, and to re be able to reach that point. And so then it really becomes informal meetings with the student and the families. Um, and at this point, we've, we haven't had the option to talk about alternative um, programming and, and alternative ways, and we would like to have that as a tool to be able to use. So, so I don't know if it's part of the, 
like expulsion process, I think that that's the recovery about what the next step is. And, and as you, you know, too, a lot of times that there's, if you do steps one, two, and three, that there's kind of that, like we, you can come back into school if you follow that, and this kind of helps get students credit in different avenues to make that happen as well. Again, the only thing I would say is from a legal standpoint, I think that opens this up where we would need to make sure that at some point we have a formal notice to prevent additional appeal, unnecessary appeals, things like that, from rolling back up through the process. And I, would, I guess I would defer to our school council in terms of, our district council in terms of what we should be thinking about there. Well, thank you for raising it. Why don't we just trust but verify that that's the appropriate language that, that we want? And uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I understand just in studying past situations, past expulsions, that the Board of Education um, has always provided some route for education, even if it wasn't on school grounds. <clears throat> there would be some other alternative um, pathway for that student to experience their, their educational coursework but why don't we right. thanks for raising the question we'd be happy to just do one more uh, run through on that and then we can bring that back maybe for another meeting do was tagging on to that is it the intent is that the board of education will we consider funding if it's pre-approved do we want to make that edit or is it because it, it reads it's kind of a given but Thank or you. is that the intent that like we if it's recommended that's a great question. Our, our, I think our role in expulsions is to make sure that we provide the board with what tools might be available, a menu, if you will, of what options are. So for example, you used Operation Fresh Start, which has just been a great partner with our school district. If we go into an expulsion hearing, we know that Operation Fresh Start isn't even available. We may not suggest that. So this would afford us the opportunity to do some legwork ahead of time, and then uh, give you that menu up to date that's out there. I think the wording is a little confusing too about being pre-approved because say Operation Fresh Start isn't available and you know Joel was expelled and it was available so he he got to do it and then I get expelled and it's not available but it was pre-approved by for him but it's not for me I think that could lead to people thinking we're being disparaging when really it's just not an option right now yeah um, and there's, that's what's nice about that menu is there, there's a whole option and not any one program is going to be right for all students. And we can, we've got a litany of programs that we can certainly explore. Um, maybe we can look on, on that language a little bit more. Thank you for the suggestions. Over to the next week. We can't approve it. No, we cannot. <laughs> no. All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. First reading, consider revisions to board policy 448, students of legal age. Sarah? Hi. Uh, this policy was put back to the Education Committee back in November, so it's been a little bit weird. But dust the cobwebs off. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't feel that long. Yeah, it goes fast, doesn't it? Uh, no major changes to this policy, just some clarification from WASB and some wording. Uh, so in bullet point number one, um, just making sure that it spells out um, that even though adult students um, are not subject to compulsory attendance laws um, and truancy enforcement, they're still subject to um, our attendance reporting requirements, whether something's excused or not excused. So just making that clear there. And then just at the bottom, our counselor I should say WASB wanted us to include a catch-all statement. And you can see that catch-all statement there, uh, just making sure that obligations for adult students are still pursued under federal and state law. I have some questions. Mostly because I will have an 18-year-old next year, so this policy will apply. Um, so I don't necessarily understand what we added, what that means. Like, I don't, I don't know what that means, the attendance reporting requirements. So sure. they, are they still bound by the 10 days? They're still, yeah, they're, they're still considered excused or unexcused. Okay. We should probably reference that policy then, okay. too, since we're specifically talking about attendance. Um, 
but I sense he's still just like adult students are still subject to all of our policies. So I get that we're calling out that they can excuse them themselves from school. I don't know. Is the difference between compulsory? Is, does this have anything to do? Because I was confused by that as well. <laughs> we could, it wasn't no, it's not just you. Because I, I, I am going to have the same situation. Okay. So we're very intense because we need to know. They're good kids. They're good kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I can go back. Is that the difference? Though? I, I can go back and look at that. Our policy again, just a cross reference to make sure. That's that great. Okay. And does compulsory have to do with truancy law yes. and that kind of thing versus? And 18, those laws don't necessarily apply to all, obviously all our policies do. Yes, yes, okay. and especially with walking for graduation and those pieces about being excused or unexcused. Right, yeah, I, so think, that would be the key. I think because it says that they have to follow all the school rules except those things, but then we're saying, but you still have to do attendance, but we're using except, I think that's where my brain is like, what are we really trying to say? Also, it says school rules except the following, and examining records isn't a school rule. But that's just nitpicky at that point. I see what your question is. So it's it's really about the STEM and not matching the STEM. It it is, and also I still I don't still don't quite understand what the wording itself means. Okay. As someone who's going to have to explain it to someone who will be 18. <laughs> We could, oh. we could reword that section under one and take it out of number one. Maybe let's work on that together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy to do. Thank you for the suggestions. Any other questions or comments about this? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. First reading, consider revisions to board policy 631 post issuance compliance policy for tech exempt and tax advantaged obligations and continuing disclosure. Scott. Sorry, I'm holding that. No. <laughs> um, so finance committee members, thank you. A couple of months ago we um, went through some of this. Um, on the surface what you'll find is essentially from page two on we'll be making part of a um, an operating procedure. Um, and we're fortunate that Allison Buchanan from Corals and Brady, who is our bond counsel that we use for drafting referendum resolutions and post-referendum borrowings and so forth, she reviewed this policy for us, um, suggested some minor modification things. Um, really, it was a, a, a decision to just refer to admin ranks, as you can see some of the additions referring to admin ranks. Uh, the policy itself, the purpose of it is really two things. One is making sure that we're in compliance when we go to a borrowing. So for example, the 2017 referendum, predominantly the high school, after the referendum was approved, we went out to bond, we received the funds. There are certain requirements that we have to follow to make sure that we stay in tax exempt status. Um, also, each year we have a continuing disclosure requirement that essentially means that we need to post both our audit report every year and our operating budget every year. And we post that on a uh, federal website for folks, investors, bondholders, et cetera, can go there. They can look at our audit reports and see what's going on in our operations. So this policy is essentially saying we will take care of those requirements and then of course the admin reg will take a lot of the minutia on page two, not to diminish the purpose of it, but minutia being that we would put it in our in our regulations. And that's the first reading. Anyone have any questions? No? All right, Scott, we'll see this next time. Scott, you're still up. Consideration of budgeted vehicle purchase. Are you gonna join us? Okay, I'm just here to spectate. Okay. <laughs> go, Scott, go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
as finance committee and Dave Reed circumstantially um, with his folks um, were able to start looking for vehicles. They had a, a vehicle budgeted this year that they wanted to purchase. When they found the vehicle, it was how long will the dealer be willing to keep it on their lot? And um, so finance committee was kind enough to allow us to bring it forward last Monday for consideration. Um, and they provided quotes here. Um, and um, what you'll find is um, Dave's not going with quite the lowest amount in terms of price, but when you look at the mileage and what it is that we're getting in terms of what they were looking for in specs, um, it made sense to us to bring that forward to the Finance Committee. Okay, Dave, what do you have to say about where you're going to use the vehicle for? <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, we, we really could use another flatbed vehicle for hauling stuff around the district. We, like, we're the uh, moving piano season, we're in the moving carpet squares and, and uh, chairs for all the concerts and things. We move a lot of things throughout the district. Uh, it'll, it'll go a long way to help us uh, uh, complete projects over the summer hauling, you know, dirt or mulch or wood for projects, things like that. So it's, it's, it, it's replacing a, a pretty tired old suburban that I inherited when I took this job. Um, last that, century. What's that? <laughs> From last century. Correct, correct. Yeah, it's uh, just on the other side of last of the century mark. But well, yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it it's a it's a uh, it checks a lot of boxes for us uh, is what is the terms I've been using. Uh, I don't have a backup for our salt dispensing vehicle. If that were to go down, it's a it's it's from a little further past the century mark. On the, uh, so it's, it's it's got some uh, age to it too. So this this one could become you know that if if need be. So it's just another more useful vehicle for us to, to get the work done around the district. So we're talking about going with Coons? Correct. Okay. Usually there's one highlighted in yellow, but there wasn't, so I made an assumption. Yep. Do you have any questions for Dave or Scott? Okay. What's your point, Dave? Sounds like you get plenty of years out of these vehicles once you get one in the end. We don't put many miles on. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. And really, it is really about them deteriorating over time. And we try to keep them just like the buses, right? We can't try to keep them flushed out underneath, but you know, um, time takes its toll. Yeah, we've. I bought a, a Dodge Dakota like when I first started. I probably they probably put ten thousand miles on it in seven eight years. It never really goes out of town. So not like we're driving to Reedsburg for a basketball game. They last it's forever. a flatbed. You can haul the team. <laughs> we could haul the team. It's possible. Yeah, we, can, we can haul the gear for sure. It can't be used for floats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Another selling point. <laughs> I think it's important to point out it is a budgeted vehicle. Yes, so yes. This is yeah, yeah. Out of the room. So I make a motion to approve the, the purchase from Coons for the 2020 Ram 3500 truck. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Leah to purchase the budgeted vehicle. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you, dude. All righty. I'm going to high five you when you come by. <laughs> Scott has one more. Consider <laughs> approval of 2324 budget revision. Thank you. So, um, we just a quick reminder we typically do budget revisions three times a year um, one in October when we um, draft the budget um, with the levy and the official state aid once at this time February or March preferably February and then either May or June if there's any last minute items that we need to button up. Um, the primary purpose for our general fund revisions has to do with the allocation of all of our dollars for our personnel now that all wages and benefits have been determined. Um, since just prior to the holiday, I'm now able to go into the budget and reallocate accordingly. Um, from a revenue standpoint, so that top table for the general fund, you'll see a $40,501 increase in revenue. It's coming from two sources. Um, the first source is um, we saw an increase of just over $40,000 in the amount of money we're getting for our library fund otherwise called the common school fund and um, that you know it'd be great if we knew that on July 1 that we'd be getting 170,000 plus 
um, but we're cautious with our estimates and we found out that amount. Um, the second one is for only an increase of $163. And one might say, well, gosh, when you see numbers so big up there, why are we changing an amount of $163? Uh, this is for our Title I funding. And when we do grant claims, we always wanna make sure that our financial software reflects exactly what our grant claim is for our actual funding, um, which is why we're increasing on the federal funds only $163. Uh, but again, on the expenditure appropriation side, it's just a matter of looking at everybody's salaries and benefits now that that's all been buttoned up. Um, DPI determines which positions fit in instruction and which ones fit in support services. Um, so it's pretty easy to hear Mark where everybody belongs. And this is just making the revisions to make that happen. Um, you'll see the last line at the bottom of the general fund table, um, projected ending fund balance. The reason why you'll see no change is because we're still reflecting a balanced budget between revenues and expenditures equaling. Um, the second table is the special projects fund. You might say, well, you know, golly gee, how can you have a zero budget and now you're budgeting 500,000? Um, at the time we did our budget, we didn't know that we'd be solidifying a $500,000 donation. Um, for the video scoreboard. So our special projects fund, we call it Fund 21. Um, that's where we're allowed to recognize gifts and donations. And so I spoke pretty extensively with DPI um, back during the holiday to make sure that that is the appropriate place to house um, donations of any size, yet alone this size. And so I got confirmation on all of the questions. So um, this is just reflecting the receipt of the donation and then the expenditure of the donation. Now, the odds are we may not be expending all $500,000 by June 30th, um, but in order to at least be able to show a balanced budget, um, that's why I'm increasing the expenditure side also by $500,000. Um, no change in fund balance um, when you do that. And then the third one is the special education fund. And this is merely the same practice that we did with the general fund. In the special education fund, now that we have all of our personnel expenses known, we've made modifications both for salaries and benefits, so it reflects our budget where, where people are, are um, placed in the budget. Um, special education can never have a fund balance at the end of the year, and that's why you'll see a projected ending fund balance of zero. And I have the word draft on there because you haven't approved this yet, and at the top, it implies that the board approved this on February 19th. And I show this because this is the format that we're required to post, um, post board approval. And um, so now I'm not being presumptuous. I just wanted you to see <laughs> what it looks like. And then um, I would get it in the newspaper for next week for official um, posting. And then I would make all the revisions in our software. Thank you for listening to me. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Finance Committee, for talking a little bit more in depth. Questions, comments? Um, I just had one. You mentioned the reclass. I, I failed to ask this in the committee meeting. The reclassification between instruction support service DPI comes out with that. Who belongs where kind of thing? Yes. Do they change that annually? Mm -hmm. Not really. Not, not so much. It's not just, so much. It, hey, we have these positions, and then they help us classify. They'll. They'll. Um, they'll make me lose my hair because they'll. They'll, um, they'll change the numerical coding in our accounting structure, but they won't change the categories. So yeah, like okay. if you're a third grade teacher, you're in instruction, even if they'll change the chart of accounts. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, so for the most part, no, it'll stay in those categories. Okay. Did anyone like to make a motion to approve? Motion to approve revised budgets. Second. Motion by Joe, seconded by Leah, to approve the 2023-2024 budget revisions. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Do you opposed? Thanks, everybody. Number eight, citizens' comments. Number nine, future agenda items. If there's anything anyone would like to discuss, please let me or Dr. Serrano know. Otherwise, we have a long list of coming topics. 
Number 10, schedule of next meetings. Anything in particular to highlight in addition to our meeting on Wednesday at the ELC? Yeah, Wednesday night will be a very special evening that gets into at 6 o'clock. Uh, appreciate uh, anyone who has the ability to attend. We will welcome your insights. And I also failed to mention under school news, I want to take a moment to thank Liam and, and Lucas for helping us out tonight on, on the uh, video. Uh, I know, busy night for you guys, and here you are helping us out. So thank you both. Thank you. Right. Would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Second. 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 Second.